So now that we have kind of an understanding for geography and kind of the political background that's taking place um, regarding kind of English colonization, um, we want to talk a little bit about Virginia itself. And Virginia and by extension kind of the whole Chesapeake region, that area that's right there in the middle of the East Coast. Um, Tobacco, of course, is the first, the, the primary, the, the big crop. Um, but over time, especially as we move from the 1600s into the 1700s, um, you start to have other crops developing too. Um, part of that is because tobacco is really hard on the ground. And so it kind of, kind of burns up the ground a little bit. Um, and so Virginia will have to start to diver diversify a little bit. Um, and as they do that, as they kind of balance out their agricultural system, what happens is that conditions get better, right? Um, people are surviving more. Um, and again, like I said about women, you know, they become very powerful in this period. Um, but you still have a pretty significant death rate. Um, but all of this means that by... Um, that by 1650, 1660, um, you're starting to have more people coming in. Um, and so part of what we, what we understand is that you have this frontier pressure, right? As more people come in, as you have more indentured contracts, and so people gain access to more land, the frontier of Virginia keeps expanding. And that puts them in conflict with Native Americans, right? The Powhatan, who initially allowed the English to come, uh, and settle because they wanted to leverage uh, for their own political purposes with their own kind of indigenous people. Um, and that is going to start to become a bigger problem, right? So you have, you have tensions uh, there. You, it, you know, the Powhatans keep trying to slow things down, but that doesn't work. Um, and you also have, um, you know, really people, you know, you have these villages, you have Jamestown, which is, which is kind of the center of government and society, but people live on these plantations farther out, right? Um, so there's a great deal of isolation happening. Um, and it's also important to recognize that that religion is not playing a major role in the settlement of Virginia. Um, that doesn't mean that they're not religious. I mean, you know, these are people where Judeo-Christian values were kind of the norm, but at the same time, you know, it's not like they're being driven by religious purposes, right? Um, so if you kind of look at that, that kind of helps you understand um, a little bit about the nature of Virginia. Again, it's tied to wealth, to farming, to agriculture. Um, you have this democratic system of government. Um, you have a social structure that is tied a lot to kind of that indentured servant. So you have an elite group that tend to be in government, that tend to be close to the coastline, that tend to have wealth and have slaves and all that kind of stuff. And then you've got, as you move farther to the frontier, you've got more ordinary people, um, people that maybe own land or have a farm, but they struggle. Right. I mean, it's taking everything they have to try to make that. And they're hacking this out of the wilderness and, you know, all that kind of stuff. So you need to understand there's some social differences. There's class differences. Um, you want to understand that women, because they are able to get married um, because of the death rate, um, that you have some empowerment for women. So when we talk about New England, you'll see some differences there. Um, and this is a, a copy of an indentured servant contract, just to kind of give you an idea. Um, again, House of Burgesses, you want to remember that's the first representative government, um, and really begins to set the standard that the colonies are going to run primarily on their own, right? I mentioned before this notion of benign neglect. Um, House of Burgesses is created in 1619 as a product of them being a joint stock company. Um, when King James comes in and kind of makes it a royal colony in 1624, what's going to happen is that he allows the House of Burgesses to keep governing. Um, why not, right? I mean, at this point, there's a whole Atlantic Ocean. It takes weeks and weeks to go from one place to the other. You know, if the House of Burgesses is running things, then let them keep running things, right? And so the big difference is that the king will appoint a governor that kind of works with the House of Burgesses, um, but otherwise it's largely going to be run by them. Um, and this particular seal, I always put this on there because to me it's kind of shows you like just the simple kind of English superiority uh, kind of complex that comes with Virginia. So you definitely have that sense of kind of entitlement to the land and that sort of thing. 
Now, in the Chesapeake area, it is not just Virginia, right? So if you think in terms of, you know, you've got Virginia, well, right up, right up from that is going to be Maryland. And this is a direct result. The creation of Maryland is a direct result of the religious conflict and the Stuarts, right? So George Cal Calvert is a Catholic. He's friendly with King James. Uh, and basically, Calvert would like to create a haven for Catholics that feel like they're not welcome in England. And so essentially, King James gives him permission to create Maryland. Uh, he calls it Maryland for the Virgin Mary. Um, and so they, he passes a Toleration Act. The Toleration Act is meant to guarantee religious freedom, so it's meant to prevent uh, Puritans or Anglicans from coming in and setting up their own system uh, that makes it hard for Catholics to, to worship the way they want to. So your first religious freedom actually comes because of Catholicism, right? comes because they're trying to protect Catholic beliefs, um, especially because by the time you get to 1650, when you're talking about, you know, the, the, the parliamentarians, the Puritans that are starting to gain some power, there's concern about what might happen with Catholics. So Maryland get, has a lot of farms, a lot of manors. Um, it's run primarily as a kind of a personal, um, you know, fiefdom, I guess you could say. Um, but he does appoint a, a governors and overseers. Um, and so you have kind of, you, you have a system of government that ultimately is held to account by, by Lord Calvert, right? Um, I'm sorry, Lord Baltimore. Um, and so that's what you see kind of happening. Um, you know, Virginia and Maryland, there's lots of competition between colonies. Colonies typically didn't like each other. Um, and we see that today. I mean, the states act the same way, you know, Texas versus Oklahoma, that kind of thing. Well, it's the same kind of concept, right? Virginia thought they were special because they were the first and Maryland thought they were better and um, because they had religious freedom. And so you just kind of have that background, right? Um, Meanwhile, happening at the same time that Virginia and Maryland are kind of developing, um, you start to have you know, the, the impact of the French and their trading uh, for furs. This is going to trigger what is called the Beaver Wars with the Iroquois, um, and they, or not with the Iroquois, between the Iroquois and other tribes, right? So the tribes are basically tearing each other apart over controlling the beaver trade because they want to trade with France. Um, and so this is kind of what you see happening. And so the Iroquois will end up on top. It'll be these beaver wars that kind of make the Iroquois the de facto indigenous group that the Europeans deal with. Now, unfortunately, this kills more indigenous people, right? More Iroquois, more Huron are killed because of it. Um, and ultimately, the the Iroquois will decide that it wasn't worth all that all that participation with trade, right? Um, but this is kind of the story there. Um, you also have, going into the 1600s, the French getting farther and farther down the Mississippi River, um, working to have more of an influence. So if you look here, it kind of gives you a sense. Um, I mean, New France is pretty big. Um, but the but New France is not this area is not settled right so if you look at the English colonies and you think well gee that's not nearly as big but there, particularly closer to the coast you have a lot more settlement um, New France is largely a series of trading posts kind of scattered throughout here and then they have a few trading posts along the Mississippi River and again that's because they wanted the Indian groups to come and trade the furs with them. Um, and this is what creates kind of this secondary conflict um, with the different groups. And so that ends up becoming an issue. But but again, it's kind of the unique relationship that the French have with indigenous people. Um, we, we'll certainly see in some of the later imperial conflicts of the 1700s um, that Indian groups will typically side. I mean, you have some that side with the British, um, but you also have some that side with the French um, because there's kind of this sense that the French – um, are less interested in controlling them. Um, but definitely the Iroquois become a little more suspicious of the influence of, um, of the Europeans. And this is going to help trigger some of the other conflicts, um, things like King Philip's War, Pequots, that kind of thing, because these Indian tribes do start to pay attention and realize, well, wait a minute, maybe this isn't working out very well for us. Um, so back in England, um, in order to understand how New England comes to be, you need to recognize that um, 
that you have Puritans, you, you have the Church of England, you have Catholics, right, in England, then you have the Puritans, and the Puritans have kind of a system of, we would recognize it much more to what we do, um, where you have a church, and the church has its own leadership, and it's kind of, it's a much looser kind of system where the members of the church help control the church, that kind of thing, as opposed to that hierarchical relationship um, that you see in the Church of England or that you see with the Catholic Church, where there's a, a head of the church and it kind of comes down from there. So the Puritans function very differently in that sense. And most Puritans, are in, they want to stay in England, right? I mean, yes, they have different religious views. They see, they think of themselves as more, more pious. They think of themselves as true Christians. They think that the Catholic Church and those groups are kind of overdone with the way that they practice religion. Um, and but they feel like they can change it from the inside. OK, so this is where you have those parliamentarians that are involved with Cromwell and that kind of thing. They're trying to change England from inside. But then you have another group. You have a group called the separatists. They're sometimes called brownists. They're sometimes called pilgrims. And these are the ones that essentially say, you know, hey, we are, um, you know, we don't we don't want to participate at all. Right. With England, like we think England's beyond saving. It's corrupt. You know, the king is corrupt. You know, there's too much influence of Catholicism. We're just done with this. Right. We want to we want to remove ourselves from this corrupt environment. And so they actually initially go to Holland. Right. To escape England, uh, except then their kids start to behave like they're from Holland and like they're Dutch. And they and that upsets the separatists. And so they they pool their resources together um, and get on a ship to come to North America. So they're supposed to come to Virginia, essentially. Right. And so that's kind of where the separatists come from. Um, now, these groups, the separatists and the Puritans, they're Calvinists. So they have that sense of, you know, preordination that God has decided already who's saved and who's not. Um, and, you know, they believe in the part of why they're called Puritans is because they believe in purification, pur purification of yourself, purification of the government. Um, and so they are highly critical of the English throne. Um, and so this, this is part of the frustration that Stu the Stuarts have with the parliament because you have these Puritans there and they're constantly criticizing the king. Um, and, you know, they also complain a lot because the Church of England is the official church of England uh, and, and the United Kingdom, or at least it was until modern period. Um, and so basically the church collected tithes. You had to pay a tithe uh, to the church. It was basically a tax. So it was a tax supported church. Um, this is what, you know, our founding fathers, when they think about church and state, that's what they're talking about. That the government collects money to help pay for a particular church. And the church is then kind of the servant of the government and that kind of thing. Um, and so, you know, they're very critical of that because they're having to pay to support the Church of England, even though they don't agree with or believe in the things that the Church of England is teaching. So if you're a Puritan, you're paying your tax to the Church of England, you're paying your taxes to the government, and then you're paying a tithe to your own church, right? So it's just extra taxation, right? Um, but too often we phrase kind of this idea as that somehow these these Puritans and the, the separatists, that they were being burned at the stake and all this kind of stuff, that's confusing some periods. That's confusing uh, Queen Mary, who was queen just before Bloody Mary, that was queen before Queen Elizabeth. She burned Protestants at the stake, so she did those things. But that's not what's happening here in the 1600s. That's not happening with the Stuart monarchy. They're, they really are not persecuting you know, people, you know, they're not persecuting the Puritans, except in that you have some extra taxation and, and you can make an argument that that was unfair. Um, and socially speaking, there could be some discrimination. Um, you know, sometimes if you were a really hardcore Puritan, you might face, you know, you're, there's going to be some social cultural capital issues with that um, because being noble, being part of the Church of England was actually how you kind of moved up in the world. Um, so there was some resentment that there might be some discrimination. Um, so just kind of keep in mind that that when we talk about the, the Puritans coming to North America, it, it's not being driven by the kind of persecution that we would imagine, right? Like I said, people being, you know, burned at the stake or being hung or tortured or anything like that. It, that's not happening. This, this is much more about money, 
right? And I don't want to pay an extra tax and I want to have all the opportunity that I want. Um, now, Puritans tend to be very focused on the family, very focused on literacy. So one of the characteristics um, of settlement in New England is a focus on family and literacy. Um, so the separatists, um, again, these middle class craftspeople kind of pool their resources. They get on a boat with some other people. So it's not all all pilgrims, right? There's a whole bunch of different people on there. Um, and they come, they're supposed to be coming to Virginia, but they get off course and they end up in New England. Um, and so they create the Mayflower Compact in part because the, this boat that's on the Mayflower, or this boat, the Mayflower, has so many diverse people in it that they have to come up with a system of government that represents the interests of everybody. So whether it's, you know, you know, pilgrims or whether it's somebody who has nothing to do with religion. Um, so it's interesting to note that Plymouth Rock is, is founded, Plymouth is founded by people of diverse religious beliefs, right? Um, so you really kind of almost have a type of religious freedom in Plymouth um, driven by, by necessity because the, the pilgrims are not the only religious group there. Um, they were too sick to travel, so they stayed where they were. Um, and so they set up the first winter, of course, is pretty rough um, because they don't have enough food. And um, they, the supply ship is slow in coming. Um, and so by the time you get to 1621, a lot of these immigrants have died. Um, but the Wampanoag Indians help them. Uh, Tisquantum helps them. To, you know, Tisquantum, of course, was a pe uh, Pequot not Pequot, whatever, Patuxic. Um, so he was a different tribe. And I told you that, you know, his group had kind of disappeared. So he's kind of hanging out with the Wampanoags, but he doesn't quite fit in. And so he kind of is able to kind of bridge a connection between the pilgrims and the Wampanoags. And this will kind of help them survive. Um, and so really the first harvest, they do have a celebration. Um, but the harvest is nothing like what we imagine it to be, right? Because um, it's really the, the Wampanoag Indians that are being generous, that are showing them how to farm that area, that are showing them how to be successful. Um, so, you know, you have the compact, all that kind of stuff. They do manage to prosper within a couple of years. So over time, um, this idea about, um, you know, about religious freedom, this idea about farming, like they overcome those things and, and end up becoming fairly successful. Um, but I like to show this particular painting um, because this painting was done in 1934, I think it is. I'd have to, I'd have to Google it to remember the guy's name. Um, so he's depicting Thanksgiving. And there's so much wrong with this picture, right? When you know the story that it's Tisquantum that helps them plant, that it's the Wampanoags that help them keep going, that, you know, half of them have died. Like this is not, you know, they're, they're not going to have these big kind of cottage looking houses, right? This is a rough environment. And the idea that the Native Americans are kind of these passive participants that's not what's going to happen, right? Um, this depiction that the gen generosity is on the part of, of the English pilgrims, that's not what's happening, right? So it's just kind of interesting uh, to keep in mind that the story for Thanksgiving is not at all what we want to think it is. It's actually quite different. Um, so then when the pilgrims are being successful, um, this attracts other Puritans. These are Puritans who are starting to get kind of fed up with Charles I. Um, and so they decide that they're going to create the Massachusetts Bay Company. Um, they manage to get some merchants and lawyers and stuff, and they want to kind of create this, this colony over there. And, and really their intent is to prove that the King of England is wrong. The King of England doesn't know what he's doing, that the right way to govern the country is through these Puritan religious values, that this whole Church of England secular thing is wrong. We can't do it that way. Like we want to pack up and we want to go to the new world and we want to set up and we're going to we're going to be this, you know, literally a city on a hill. We're going to be this example for the world to see. And everyone's going to realize that we were right. Right. That the Puritans were doing things the right way. Um, and so they do manage to get a royal charter. Um, they, it's actually a little more, there's some tricks and some bribery going on, but they do manage to get a Royal charter and Charles the first in some ways is like fine, good riddance. Maybe these Puritans will go away and leave me alone. Um, and of course, you know, the, then the English civil war develops. Um, but this kind of shows you the Massachusetts Bay colony, kind of like with Virginia, 
right? It's at initially this huge, massive territory, right? Now, over time, it will end up being much smaller, but initially it was this big, massive territory. And so here's Plymouth, Boston, Salem, all right there along the coastline. Um, and so they're going to set up uh, Plymouth and uh, Massachusetts, and they will have stockholders as well. But all of these stockholders are members of the church, right? Not the Church of England, but the Puritan Church, um, the Congregationalist Church, I think is the official name. Um, and so they, you know, they believe. So, so you have stockholders. So everyone has an equal share. And that's important because their form of government is going to have elements of democracy in it. But not total democracy because the requirement is you have to be a member of the church, right? Um, and so John Winthrop is going to be the governor. He's going to be the one in charge. Um, and again, you have to be a member of the church in order to vote. Um, and then in order to serve on the town council, you have to be a member of the church, right? So this kind of, kind of creates a little different perspective, right? Because if you're thinking in terms of, well, you know, the, you know, Massachusetts is founded for religious freedom. Well, we know first off that they weren't really being like like burned at the stake or anything. So, you know, we got to use the term persecution a little bit loosely. Um, certainly there's, you know, you have to clarify what you mean by that type of persecution. Um, that's issue number one. Then issue number two is they claim they're here for religious freedom, but it's not really religious freedom because unlike in Maryland where they have toleration because they want everybody to be able to settle there. And they want, you know, now granted Lord Baltimore is controlling the government, but it doesn't matter what church you belong to. In Massachusetts, you have to belong to the Congregationalist Church. You have to be a member and you have to be a member in good standing, which means you have to follow all of the rules. So there's really not as much religious freedom with Massachusetts Bay as one would think, right? Um, and so you really have um, you really have kind of a theocratic government, a government driven by the church, um, and you do have a bicameral legislature. Um, everything in New England is centered on the family, the town, and the church, right? They believe in a strict gender order. Um, you know, God is the father, Jesus is the son, um, you know, the church is the body. And just like that, you have the husband as the head of the house, followed by the, the mother, followed by the children. And there's a strict hierarchy in how everything is supposed to go. Um, they tend to, if you're a member of the church, especially early on in the 1600s, if you're a member of the church, you automatically got a plot of land, right? So, you know, it wasn't about capitalism necessarily because they're not selling off the land. They're making sure members of the church have land with which to prosper. Now, what happens though, is instead of having these vast plantations, like you see in Virginia particularly, but also some in Maryland, what you have are these very small family farms, right? So, so Massachusetts pretty quickly becomes these series of little small farms centered around villages. Um, and it just kind of changes the way New England looks, right? New England just looks very different um, in many different ways. And, and the temperatures are, are less, you know, it's, it's not swampy and hot in the summer. So there's less illness um, because you don't have those swampy areas. They're just It's just less deadly up there. Um, combined with the fact that because you have lots of family support, because they ship families over, right? Beginning with the pilgrims, going with the Puritans, they're moving entire family groups, right? It's not young men coming over as indentured servants, working really hard, and then hoping they find somebody, right? Um, instead, it's these entire family groups. And, and if you think about kind of emotional health and satisfaction, that could help improve survival rates. Um, in addition, right, that just the whole focus is completely different. Instead of extracting cash crops, right, it's all about kind of family farming, family survival, and really kind of blending in. Um, now, they will have some tensions with indigenous people, um, and there's lots of anxiety in these Puritan towns um, because they are so religiously based. There's a lot of, you know, kind of sense that out in the forest is, is Satan and, and in the towns is God, and there's this kind of perpetual, you know, us versus them, good versus evil concept going on. And that's going to matter because that will help shape our understanding of the Salem witchcraft trials, right? So that's, you, so you definitely want to kind of know that. Um, you also, so this is kind of a picture of some Puritans, uh, kind of give you a sense. Actually, I think these are Puritan dissenters, but, um, 
But again, family is a big deal. This is a picture of John Winthrop. If you've ever heard the t heard the phrase "beat the drum," you know I, I, you know, you know he's going around the school beating the drum, right? That's a reference to Puritans, um, and maybe that's a that's an idiom that nobody else but me knows. But um, but the idea is that the Puritans, when it was time for church, they would have somebody go around town beating a drum, and it would call people to church. And if you missed the beating of the drums, then you would get fined. And if you did that too many times, then you would go to the stocks. Right. So church attendance was required, and you would literally go to jail for not attending church. Um, and so just kind of some interesting little tidbits like that. Um, and again, you know, I put on here, is this the American model? How democratic is this really? Um, yes, you are allowed to vote, but only if you're a member of the church and only if you're a member of the church in good standing. So if you've been late to church too many times, you're not a member in good standing and you won't get to vote. Um, so they have lots of restrictions on that. Um, again, um, the church controls taxation. Um, and you know, they control the, the legal system. They like, they control all the wheels of power. Right. Um, and you know, if this will end up creating some issues because as Massachusetts grows and gets bigger and bigger and bigger, and you have more people arriving that aren't members of the Puritan church, they're going to kind of resent the fact that they can't participate in government. In addition, you know, the children of these initial settlers and their children, are going to be little, a little less kind of persnickety, a little less dogmatic about their religious beliefs. And so they're going to have some frustration too. So what we'll start to see, and, and I don't dwell too much on this, but you do start to see some changes in Massachusetts government as we move into the 1700s, largely because people realize this theocratic model is not super democratic and it's not really fair to all the people um, that maybe don't think the same way as far as the Puritan, Puritan denomination and that kind of thing. Um, so when you're contrasting kind of New England, Massachusetts, that kind of Puritan area with the more che with the Chesapeake, you know, Virginia, Maryland area, um, you know, you have a difference in church church influence um, and the role of the church within the community. Um, you also have, you know, some differences in the way voting is carried out, right? Um, in Ch the Chesapeake, it's very much tied to land ownership and privilege, um, whereas with, with New England, it's going to be very much tied to church membership. Um, and, you know, and, and then you have in New England, the communities are much more tight knit. You have these smaller farms centered around villages and they stay very close together. Whereas out in, in Virginia, right, you have this concept of the frontier where things keep moving farther and farther out. Um, and so that's kind of what makes it interesting. Now, pretty early, one of the problems as far as the Puritans are concerned is when you, when your religious belief is centered on reading the Bible for yourself and communicating with God and, and recognizing whether God, you know, approves of, approves of what you're doing. And, and I've mentioned this before that remember part of what the Puritans, part of what that mindset is, is that if God approves of what I'm doing, that everything goes great. Right. And if something doesn't go well, then it's because I've not pleased God. OK. And so something like my cow died means that I must have committed a sin and I need to do lots of reflection. I need to read the Bible. I need to talk to God. I need to find out what that sin is and then repent of it so that no more cows die. OK. So this translates to for the Puritans as they come into Massachusetts in the 1620s, when they see these vast areas of land that have been depopulated by disease and, and, and pressure from some of the earliest contact, they assume, well, God means for us to be here. This is what God wants, right? Um, but the problem with this is when you emphasize personal literacy, personal piety, and kind of this idea of self-reflection about what am I doing to please God? Do I know that that God approves of, of how I'm living, right? Um, you tend to encourage people to start thinking for themselves. And that's what starts to happen quite a bit. Uh, people start thinking for themselves and they start having some slightly different interpretations. So the irony here is that the Puritan faith that comes over from you know England because they feel like they're being mistreated in England, they come over, they create this really strict system all tied around their church 
right? But the irony is because of the nature of their religious beliefs, they end up having all these dissenters, right? All these people that don't fully buy into the Puritan way of life, okay? Um, and so part of the story of the expansion of the colonies, uh, particularly in New England, comes back to the fact that you've got these dissenters. Um, most notably, right? Um, you know, the disagreement about voting, the disagreement about how they treat uh, Native Americans, right? Remember, you've had the Pequot War in 1637. There were a lot of Puritans that when they heard about what happened with the Pequots, that they set fire, set fire to a village and then slaughtered all the people escaping, they said, whoa, wait a minute that's not what we're supposed to be doing. And so you start pretty quickly having disagreements over how they how they treated Native Americans. You start having disagreements over how they're handling voting. You have disagreements over how they're handling land distribution. Um, and so all of these conflicts, right, over how the government's being handled by this Puritan church um, is going to lead to these different groups, right, um, who tend to be highly critical of the Puritan faith and ultimately have put their belief in the revelation from God as opposed to, well, the church knows best. And this is going to lead them to kind of set up their own places. So, for example, Thomas Hooker, 1634, um, wants broader church membership and more voting, right? So he has a problem with the control of the church and, and the way things are governed. Um, Connecticut will also have a little group that says, no, we don't agree with that. We want things to be stricter than that. So you have groups going both directions, right? We want things looser. We want things tighter. Um, Roger Williams is probably one of the more well-known dissenters uh, in 1636 who creates Rhode Island because he in particular says there has to be a separation of church and state. You can't have this connection between the church and the state. It, it hurts both of them. And he says that the way the Massachusetts Bay Company is treating the Native Americans, that that's wrong, that that's sinful. And so he disagrees with that. He says, we can't keep taking their land. We need to you know, pay them back. We need to do this, which is highly controversial um, because the Massachusetts Bay Company doesn't want to pay the Native Americans for the land. Um, and then you've got Ann Hutchison. I like to mention Ann Hutchison, 1638. Um, she was she was actually a midwife and she was known. She read the Bible a lot and she was known for having Bible studies. And some men started coming to her Bible study. Well, the church leadership didn't agree with that. They said that's not the proper place for a woman. And they actually call her into a trial and they say, hey, you know, you've got to stop teaching. You're not allowed to do this. And she says, OK, fine, I'll stop teaching. And or all or rather, she said, I only teach to women. So she goes back to teaching women, but then men start showing up again. And so they drag her back before the court. And this all coincides with she delivers a baby that was that was deformed. Um, and they blame they say, oh, well, this is proof. God doesn't approve of you. Right. Because, <laughs> you, you know, this happened to this baby. Right. Um, and so she ends up basically getting shunned out of the community and she ends up in Long Island, um, you know, because she gets expelled. Right. And this was the typical method that the Puritans in Massachusetts used when when they couldn't get somebody to play along uh, and do what they were supposed to do. They would expel them. They would kick them out. Um, and that was a pretty terrifying proposition. Remember, these are tight knit communities. They kick you out and you're going to be out on the frontier. And remember, even people in Virginia aren't crazy about being out on the frontier. That's kind of nerve wracking. Right. So there's some some concern, some anxiety with that. Um, and so it just kind of gives you a sense that you have, you know, Connecticut, you have Rhode Island, you have, um, you know, people being pushed out because they don't agree with religious beliefs. For example, you have the Quakers, right? And we'll talk more about the Quakers uh, in the next section when we talk about Pennsylvania. And the Quaker faith starts actually in England too. Um, but part of what happens with these with these Puritan dissenters is that Quakers kind of gain a foothold. And so then the, the Puritan church is driving the Quakers out and that becomes a whole nother thing. So again, the church is putting that pressure on people um, over these various religious beliefs. And then the last thing I'll leave you with is going to be the Pequot War, which I've already kind of talked about. Um, this idea that they had didn't need to save the Native Americans and that, well, God must want us to have this land or it would, there wouldn't be so much available. Uh, you know, they aren't actually using the land. They don't have it fenced off. They aren't doing, you know, they don't have cattle grazing. Like they don't know what to do with it. So it's okay for us to take it. 
Well, the Pequots don't agree. And so they're kind of pushing back. And so you have this conflict going on. Um, and then you have basically the all the guys in Massachusetts kind of attacking, uh, you know, the, the Pequots and burning down a village and, and essentially committing an act of genocide. Right. Um, and so this is going to look pretty bad. Um, and this is part of what kind of breaks down the, the control of the Puritan church in Massachusetts. Um, but also it does really set a negative tone. So when you talk about King Philip's war that develops later in the 1600s, um, part of the context of King Philip's war is going to be the fact that you've had um, you know, you've had these, uh, you know, you've had the Pequot War, and that's created some bad feeling, right? So the King Philip's War is going to come out of this. Uh, you've got the Powhatan conflict. Part of what's happening with King Philip's War is you start to have conversations about how can these indigenous groups fight back? How can they unify? Um, so King Philip is absolutely about trying to kind of create some sense of unity to push back against the English. Um, and he struggles to do that. I mean, the, the different indigenous tribes have a long history of being very competitive with each other over territory. Um, but he is one of those early voices that's like, hey, look, we got to focus on kicking these guys out. Like they, they need to not be here anymore. And so that's that's kind of what he's pushing. And so then when he gets killed, um, that really kind of solidifies that control up in the Northeast. Um, and this is a wood carving from uh, that describes kind of the Pequot War and show, it gives you a little bit of a sense for how violent it was. Um, so that's pretty much it for chapter two. Um, chapter three really goes into the other aspects of the early colonial settlement. So we'll talk about that a little bit more. Um, so the document activities we'll be doing kind of bridge um, a little bit between what we've talked about in chapter two, King Philip's war kind of bridges us towards chapter three. So we'll kind of look at that in that context. And so hopefully you'll walk away from this week with a much better sense of kind of what these early English colonies look like. Um, so anyways, that's pretty much it.